Okay, hi everybody. I'm Valeria Bernadic from FXTrade.com, and I want to thank you all, and particularly Raid, for being here today in another edition of the Beginners Corners webinar. Right? As you know, the Beginners Corner is a project we started with FXTrade.com this year, uh, trying to help beginners to understand the market and stay in the market. Moreover, right? But it's not only for beginners. Anyway, I believe that uh, every teacher has its book, right? So. It was not uh, a good idea to have just one expert giving all classes, and more decide, and me too, and we are very proud of that decision, to invite different experts. Today, I'm more than pleasure to present Raghi uh, in here, uh, and hope you enjoy the webinar, okay? And I will be hearing it too, okay? And let's see if everyone can learn something new today. Thanks all, and welcome again. This is Rocky Horner. Thank you very much, Valeria, for that nice introduction. And what you're doing here with FX Street with the beginner series is wonderful. And it's something that I think a lot of us, experienced and novice, can benefit in terms of going back to the basics. So I hope everybody here, and I, and I recognize some of the names. I know quite a few of you are also very experienced seasoned traders. But going back to the basics always reminds us of those things that we've forgotten. And for those traders who are brand new, I will do my best to break down how it is that I look at the not only so not only something you can understand, but something that you can apply to the market hopefully right away. So I'm sitting here with my cup of coffee. And I have my notes. So what I want to do, hopefully, is encourage everybody here to also take some notes. And if you have any questions, feel free to type them in. I will read them aloud so that everybody knows the question. And then we can go about answering it. Of course, we have uh, just, I believe, 60 minutes together. So I'm going to do my best to cover all the material. But I'm not... I'm not going to be limited to the framework, so if you guys want to go beyond that, please feel free. But there's going to be just a few main concepts that I want to make sure everybody knows here. And a few things before we start. Every expert that you have here, you know, the best thing that we can share with you is not some sort of impression that we know everything about the market, because nobody does, especially when it comes to a market as vast and intercorrelated with so many other markets as the Forex is. The second thing is, I'm only going to share with you things that I actually use. So those tools that I choose not to use, and, and certainly there are many, many of them, my choice not to use them is not because I feel they are not good tools. My choice not to use them stems from the fact that I have another tool that satisfies that requirement for me already. And and finally, I think the, the thing that we want to make absolutely clear is that these are just my opinions, okay? This is my opinion based upon my trading career that spanned the equities markets, the futures markets, the forex market, and the options markets over the past, actually, more than 20 years now. So... Hopefully what I'm doing is giving you a look into my brain, a look into my trading office, and you find what you think works for you. And that which doesn't work for you, hopefully you can learn from somebody else. And that's what's so great about having this type of exposure to so many different traders and teachers and coaches and analysts and so forth. Okay, so with all that being said, let me tell you the, the first thing that – affected me more than any other thing in my my trading career. And that is the idea of Dow theory. So I think what I want to do here, and just bear with me a moment, what I like to do from time to time is just kind of write notes as we're going along. So I'm just going to go ahead 
can use uh, Word as a as a whiteboard, if you don't mind, and we can just take some notes together from that. Bear with me. I'm going to just jump on over to Word here, and we'll do that. So Dow Theory. That's probably the most important aspect of my trading because what Dow Theory taught me was that home for me was that I was measuring the market, and it's unusual how difficult it is to type and talk at the same time, but I was measuring the market looking for psychology. So if price equals opinion, what I'm doing by looking at a price chart is measuring that opinion and the culmination of a bullish psychology or a bearish psychology or even no opinion where the market will congest or consolidate. So Charles Dow looked at this and he coined a few terms and he called them, I believe, market trends or phases. And the, the actual lingo is less important to me than the actual idea behind it. He believed that there were essentially three phases or trends. An accumulation, which is a narrow sideways, usually very low volatility, sometimes low volume direction or trend or phase. Markup, which is better known as an uptrend, and distribution, which typically follows some sort of trend. And it's when, and you guys have all seen this, it's when the late money comes into the market, the volatility increases, the attention is usually very, very intense on that particular pair or market or whatever it may be, and we start to lose the momentum and the sentiment and the organization that created the trend in the first place and prices begin to move very haphazardly in a range. So what happens is on the very strong up days, the bulls feel very justified and on the very strong down days, the bears feel very justified, yet there really is no clarity in the market and we're losing the organization of the momentum and the sentiment that turns into the trend. And in all due respect to Mr. Dow, there is a marked down. Now, remember, Charles Dow was a stock market participant. So stocks have a bullish bias. In other words, people are typically long in the stock market. They don't often try to take advantage of, of being short, of short selling. But we know in the Forex market, there's really always a bull market somewhere. So, you know, for example, it, whether it be something like the Euro-US dollar pair, and let's jump on over to that here, jump on over to the Euro-US dollar. So if I'm looking at the Euro-US dollar, this movement overall movement lower is actually a bullish U.S. dollar. Even though we have a bearish trend on this pair, behind this movement is a weak euro and a strong greenback. So I still feel that the philosophies of Charles Dow and what has posthumously become Dow theory is still very applicable to the Forex market and, and, and to the futures market as well. Dow theory is so important to me because what it then helped me determine is the fact that when the market is trending, there's a particular type of strategy that I will look to employ. I will make sure that I'm using trending indicators. I will make sure that my emphasis is on trend following. When the trend is lost and, and therefore we lose the clarity or organization of the sentiment and the momentum, I then realize that there is no longer a dominant bullish or bearish psychology and prices will then begin to congest or consolidate 
In other words, it might be a directionless market. There's another strategy that I will apply to that. So when Dell defined those different market phases, I realized not only do I need a way to identify those phases, I also need a way to trade those phases. So um, I'm also here to say that the tool that I'm going to focus in on and these concepts are less about telling you that you need to completely revamp all your strategies. In fact, that's not the case at all. What I hope you'll do once this session is over is go back and look at all your strategies. Become a little introspective here. Look at your strategies. That's what I'm hoping that you'll do. Examine each of your, your entry strategies and ask yourself which market phase What was it designed for? If you don't know which market phase, whether it be a trending strategy, whether it be a non-trending strategy, if you don't know which phase it was designed for, you don't know when to apply it. And I think a lot of people, for, for some traders, this is an unusual question to ask because most people – most people actually look at these strategies, they look at their trading, and they just haphazardly apply the strategy, rather than asking themselves, which environment will it thrive in? Which environment was it designed to thrive in? Some traders go about it another way. They define themselves. So, in other words, they'll tell themselves, okay, I am a trend follower. And that's fine. I actually love trend following. I think it's a terrific strategy if there is a trend, right, if there is a trend. So if you are a trend follower, task number one, job number one is identifying a trending market. That's job number one, if you are a trend follower. If you are a, a trader who likes to take advantage of sideways markets, there's actually two types of sideways markets. Remember I mentioned accumulation, and we also discussed distribution. Well, accumulation is where I will apply a momentum strategy. In other words, I will wait for that sideways price movement to reveal whether the bulls or bears will win that, have won that battle. In a distribution market, prices tend to exhaust because of the higher volatility. So that's where I'm looking for a range-bound strategy. A lot of people might look at a stochastic or some sort of overbought or oversold type strategy that allows you to fade ceilings and floors. Okay? But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. My main goal, again, as a trader, is not to limit or define myself by saying what kind of trader I am, but rather, first, identify the strategies that I have as strategies that are either meant to capitalize on trending markets or non-trending markets, and then have a tool that I can use to identify which type of market I am in. Now, the challenge with the question, identifying the kind of market that we're in, I'll tell you, that's not something that you'll find in a lot of books. Some traders will say that, you know, once you have a trend line, say a downtrend line resistance, uh, that's when you have a, a downtrend. Well, trend lines, Using a trend line to identify a trend is extremely lagging. Some traders will use the 20, 50, and 200 period simple moving averages. I did that for a short amount of time. Using those three very psychologically, very well-known, very well-followed indicators 
and looking at the way they cross with one another, looking at the way prices cross with them, that is something that a lot of traders will use to identify the bullishness or bearishness in the market. And that's fine too. But what I really wanted to do is have something I think that would not just identify when the market's begun trending, but when it also has transitioned out of a trend into accumulation or into distribution, and also have a dynamic support and resistance that allows you to also define where the trend would no longer be valid. And with those questions in mind, I went about trying to find a set of tools that would allow me to do just that. And that's where I came about discovering how I could use the 34 period, which is a Fibonacci number, the 34 period exponential moving averages on the high, the low, and the close. Now, just out of curiosity, how many of you are already familiar with my 34 EMA wave? And, and while I'm at it, how many of you are already familiar with what I call grab candles? Okay. So I do want to mention that the indicators I have running on this chart right now are available for free in one of two places. Okay, neither one of these, I, I will tell you exactly what they are, exactly how they work. Some people go ahead and code them on their own, or you can download the free custom indicator for the MT4 platform. So you can either go to, and, and I'll tell you which one is best for each scenario. If you have a version of MT4 other than the Interbank FX version, head on over to RoggyHorner.com and search for Grab 2.0. And there is a compressed file that you can download, and there's also a video that teaches you how to, how to install it. If you don't want to get into that, your alternative, and it doesn't have to be a live account, it can be a demo as well, or any current account holders for Interbank FX, you can go to ibfx.com and download their version of MT4, which is called the Interbank FX Trader 4 platform. And already installed in that version is a template for the wave and the grab, and also the individual indicators for the wave and grab. So there's two ways you can get it. It's really up to you as to which way you'd like to do it. But they are available for free. And what they'll do is they'll do the color coding, which I'll explain to you in a moment, as well as the three lines of the wave. By the way, the other two moving averages that I have on this chart is the 200 period simple moving average, which I'm actually going to just delete for our purposes here, although I do recommend you keep them on your chart, and the 20 period simple moving average. So I keep my grab, my wave, a 20 period, in fact, let's go ahead and make sure I jot this down on the notes here for you all. So at every chart that I have, and by the way, this doesn't matter if it's futures, like when I'm trading crude oil and the dollar index or the Dow, doesn't matter if it's a stock, like if I'm trading Apple or Amazon, or if it's the Forex pair, every chart, my 34 EMA wave, my grab candles, a 20 period and a 200 period simple moving average on the close. I also have a couple of the tools that I'll use, and that's they're completely optional. That is Power Stats, which, by the way, I do webinars on on Monday and Wednesday at fxstreet.com, where I talk about Power Stats and, and chart patterns. I also use Auto Charting for the chart patterns. Those are optional for those of you that don't want to use it or don't have access. But there are a number of brokers that will give you access to both those tools 
for free. So those are optional, but I think they're very powerful. In fact, if we have time, I'll take a peek at PowerStats so you can see how it is I designed my trading day to work around the natural rhythm of Forex pairs. So we'll try to make time for that as well. So that's what's on every chart. So I want to take a brief moment here to make sure there aren't any questions. Does anybody have any questions? I know this has been fairly rudimentary so far, but I want to make sure I tackle the questions as they, as they arise, and we're going to get into the chart set up with the tools here in a moment. All right, so I'll keep an eye on the text window. I don't see any questions so far, so either I'm being very clear or you're all asleep. I'll take 50-50 is my guess, all right? When I first started trading, one of the things that I was very conscious of was how much data was in my chart window. And since we're talking about the basics, what could be more basic, what could be more foundational than how you decide how much data to include in your chart view? I've, I've learned over the course of teaching for, the, for more than a decade and also studying traders from the U.S. to Korea to Jamaica, you name it, you know, just all over the world, how they set up their charts. And I realized that it's a very random thing that traders do in terms of what they include on their chart. I find that new traders tend to look at very few candles simply because they're intimidated and more data is confusing and intimidating and tends to, you know, become a distraction. And experienced traders tend to often look at too much. Well, it's a very subjective thing. And so my opinion was each time frame, and the time frames that I trade are the five minute. I have a very specific strategy for the five minute. I trade the 15, 30, 60, 240, and daily. All the common time frames that are available on the uh, MT4 platform. And you know what, let me, let me resize this window so it's not quite as large because I'm only using a single window. Let me go and resize this so it would make a whole lot more sense, wouldn't it? So one of the things that I want to keep in mind as I look at each time frame is that I believe that there is a certain memory to the touch points and previous highs, lows, support resistance that are relevant to that time frame. For example, if I'm looking at a daily chart and I'm only looking at a couple months or a few weeks, I'm going to miss out on a lot of the relevant touch points and therefore support and resistance and trend lines that are important for me to note on this chart. So whenever I'm looking at a daily time frame, I want to begin my analysis with approximately a one-year view. Now, I realize that the vertical axis, the calendar axis, doesn't always allow you to squeeze in exactly these market memories that I'm going to tell you about, but get as close to it as you can. If you need to be over just a little bit, like for example, you see here I'm down at the last week of February to the last week of November, uh, actually December 1st, instead of being December 1st. Uh, if I click it over one more notch, I'm all the way to May. So what you could do is simply drop a vertical line on what would be one year essentially, and then from here on, look at the significant highs and lows. Okay, the significant, oops, significant highs and lows, the trends. Okay, you can look at some of the touch points in order to draw your trend lines. Okay, so from this one year view, now draw all the lines and levels you need to draw in order to 
I think use the touch points that are most psychologically relevant. You know, when we squeeze in here in a moment, you can tighten up some of these touch points if you've missed them, but just get the general lines drawn first from this view. From the, this is one year here. To the right of this red vertical line is one year. So on that daily chart, when it, draw in all those. So then once I've done these longer term trend lines, then I can zoom in a little bit to a more comfortable view. That February view that we talked about before. And, and I can make sure those touch points were hitting all the levels that they needed to. Maybe there are some more subtle ones that are visible once I go shorter term. But from that one year view, I want to take note of the overall direction of the year significant rallies and declines, and then draw my trend lines. I might even draw some Fibonacci's from that longer-term view as well. Now I might look at a Fibonacci level like this, okay, or maybe I might look at a more recent last major move like this. But these are things that I'll do from the market memory. Draw all those lines in, and then I have my analysis ready. So it's a one-year view for the daily. Let me list the views for the other time frames. For the 240, it's basically no less than one month, but I typically find you're going to be somewhere around six to eight weeks on the 240-minute chart. So no less than one month. You really don't need more than two, but you might find yourself somewhere around six to eight weeks. If it's a little bit more, that's fine, but just do that same thing again. Drop a vertical line. Uh, from about two months out and draw all your lines and levels. For the one-hour chart, look for all your relevant trend lines, support, resistance, Fibonacci, and so forth, highs and lows, uh, over the course of the last two weeks. Two weeks. Okay? That is what you really need to focus in on on a one-hour chart. For a 30-minute chart, your look back or market memory is really no more than two weeks, but no less than one week. And then finally, the 15, 15 minute chart, no less than three days, and you really don't need more than five trading days. So about one week, let's say one calendar week, but five trading days to about three trading days is all you need for a 15 minute time frame. So now that you know how much data you should consider when you're drawing your lines and levels on a particular time frame, let's take the next step, which is realizing that each time frame has its own market trend or phase very often. And this brings us to this concept of directional bias, which is where we jump out to the daily chart. And really, before we make any kind of – let's go to another pair. Uh, is there a particular pair here that anybody wants to look at? We've been looking at the euro US dollar, but if you prefer something else, let me know. And just bear with me, I'm going to go top off my coffee. So I'll look for those those requests here in just a second. All right, looks like the winner is the Aussie. And then we can look at the pound yen. Okay. Let's go to the Aussie. So directional bias is based upon this understanding that I believe that the daily chart is the most psychologically relevant time frame. doesn't mean it's the most tradable. I don't want you thinking that means you should always trade off the daily, although I probably spent the first five years of my career doing just that before the Internet brought streaming quotes. I started off my career updating charts by hand, using a telephone line to get prices, and speaking with my broker and then updating paper charts. But the reason the daily chart to me is the most relevant is because I believe it's the one that's watched by the widest audience, and it's the one that people use to determine what the dominant or overall trend is. Again, it's not because I'm going to trade this one exclusively. It's because I believe it holds the key to the dominant and most well-accepted, well-known opinion of, of any particular symbol. So, again, daily chart means that one year look back. And from this look back, what it does is by having a consistent amount of data for each time frame, I 
can then look at the angle of the wave and determine which market trend, going back to Dow, right, which market trend that we're actually in. So if that's the case, that the important thing is to look at the, the 34 EMA wave and the angle at which it's traveling to determine the market trend. And let me go ahead and clean up this chart a little bit. There we go. What I want to do, and this is an easy trick for those of you that are just getting the getting used to doing this idea of a clock angle. So you notice I dropped this cross here. This is 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 6 o'clock. This gives me a framework. And then I can drop a trend line following the angle of the middle line of my wave, which is the 34 period EMA. So from within this market memory or look back, what angle do you think this trend line is moving in? I'd say it's moving at about 5 o'clock, wouldn't you guys? And if it's moving at 5 o'clock or anything between 4 and 6, I've got a downtrend. If it was moving up between 12 and 2, I've got an uptrend. And if it's moving smoothly sideways, imagine 3 o'clock, you've got that accumulation cycle where the volatility is very low and the range is narrow and prices are relatively quiet and organized just simply not trending. If there's higher volatility, more erratic highs and lows, a wider range, the wave will typically be moving at what I call a 2 to 4 o'clock angle. By the way, it's easier to identify a 2 to 4 o'clock wave angle by what it's not rather than by what it is. In other words, if the market is not steep enough to be in a trend, either 12 to 2 or 4 to 6, and it's not flat and smooth enough to be a 3 o'clock, what you're left with is likely that transitional market or that distribution, wider ranging, volatile environment called 2 to 4. So here I see that this chart of the daily Aussie, in terms of the angle of the wave, is pointing to a downtrend. Now, I don't want to ignore prices, okay? So let's even though the, the angle is, is kind of pointing to a down, actually, you know what? I've got this power stats over it. It looks like it's been hooking. Let's zoom in a little bit. So it actually was, okay? And then when prices broke the wave, that actually invalidates the downtrend. And if anything, if you take a, a zoom in here, and this is not my typical trading computer, but actually if you zoom in to this spot right here, what you'll see is with the move higher, the wave actually is hooked a little bit, and it's actually moving at about this angle right now. So it's actually no more 5 o'clock. It's actually, as of today, in breaking the, the 34 EMA high, breaking the resistance of the wave, it's no longer a downtrend. It's actually more of a 2 to 4 o'clock. It's actually transitioning. It's a transitional market. Okay, you can see that right there. In the smaller view, uh, it was hard to see the angle of the wave. But for those of you that have been watching me for any period of time, you know that a swing trade or any kind of trend is invalidated when it breaks the wave. So for those of you that are unaware of that rule, anytime prices break the, res the dynamic resistance in a downtrend or the dynamic support in an uptrend of the wave itself, then that invalidates the trend. So the trend is, no is invalidated by the break up higher through, and this is the 34 period EMA high, and you can actually see this middle line of the wave pointing a little bit more uh, to say if this would probably be a two to four. So we have a transitional market here. Okay. What happens and, and why is this directional bias so important? Do I have an overall dominant psychology, down psychology in this market any longer? I actually did, but I don't any longer. What are the visual clues? Before I had solid red grab candles. That's these candles right here. I had a four to six angle on the wave. Then I had a blue grab candle here, indicating a little bit more of a neutral. Then I had green grab candles, indicating a bit more bullishness. So 
with all that being said, in terms of the grab candles reflecting the sentiment and momentum of the trend, so now we're going a little bit more, or the market, going a little bit more green, showing some bullishness in the sentiment and momentum, breaking the resistance of the wave. This market could be said to no longer be in a downtrend, not in an uptrend either. It's a transitional sideways market. We could say possibly distribution. So there is no longer a dominant bearish or bullish psychology here. Even though the sentiment and momentum is bullish, the 34 EMA wave is not confirming or identifying any kind of trend any longer. This is very important to know on the daily because this now means there is no dominant bullish or bearishness on the daily chart. And therefore, what I recommend when I lack an up or down trend on the daily is to focus in on shorter term time frames. Because the lack of organization the lack of a concerted overall opinion is going to affect follow through. So for me, that means I will go look at intraday trading on the five minute. I'll look at the 15, the 30, and maybe the 60, but typically I'll focus on the 5, 15, and 30 in a situation where the daily chart does not have a dominant directional bias. So just as Dan mentioned, and you're ahead of me there, with that flattening and the turning, hopefully that answered your question. Dan's question was, we did have that 5 o'clock line, but now you can see the wave line is flattening or turning. How do I interpret that? And I hope that answered your question there, Dan, because that's exactly what we're in the midst of, that transition. When we have that transition, again, I want to retreat to shorter-term time frames with the expectation that we lack the organization of sentiment and momentum to give me longer-term follow-through. Right now, the 15 and 30-minute time frames are actually consolidating into a narrowing range. Eventually, I might have something like a triangle pattern, breakout or breakdown on either one of those time frames. So that's something to consider. Another thing to consider, and, and we are in, a, in an unusual environment, obviously, with, with what's been going on, not just for the past few months, but actually just, just yesterday with the, the major announcement of the coordinated intervention and the dramatic shift in not just even the availability of dollars, but the affordability of dollars in Europe. We had an unbelievable risk on day, which I think is a little bit uh, less so today as we look at traders really digesting the fact that that one move is likely not going to be a solution, but it is a near-term reason to be somewhat hopeful. But the, the basic problems still persist. We're just heading in a more positive direction with all the central banks being so proactive. That certainly is a, a reason to be bullish, but I don't know if it's a reason to keep propelling the market higher, uh, one through 12,000 on the Dow. It still has not been able to get a decent amount of support above 1250 on the S&P, and traders are really going to consider whether or not there's a reason to continue to keep that risk appetite alive and kicking. Now, why do I mention the Dow and the S&P, by the way? I mention those two markets because if I am trying to gauge the risk appetite or risk aversion in the market, the equities market and the U.S. dollar index are a great place to go identify that. So in terms of my approach with the Aussie, it will be very much a short-term affair. It will be, it'll be something where I don't expect longer-term follow-through, which is a shame because I would love to take advantage of the intraday uptrend on, say, the 60-minute time frame or even the 240 on a correction. But I don't want to put myself in a position where my trade requires the organization 
in order to get the follow-through that I need to my profit target. Because nothing's worse than getting into a meandering market, one without a dominant psychology. And even though the, the Aussie had an unbelievable breakout day yesterday, as did a lot of pairs, I, again, if I don't feel the risk environment will remain, I have to question my expectation for another push higher. In fact, there's a pretty good level that I can look at, a Fibonacci level here, that could shed light on the line in the sand as to where and when I might begin to feel a little bit more bearish. And I think the 382 level, uh, Fibonacci, the 38.2%, might be one to watch. It seems to be where the battle is being fought for supremacy of the near-term sentiment and momentum of the Aussie. Okay. By the way, uh, one of the things that I discussed in yesterday's FX Street morning chat, the one that I do Mondays and Wednesdays at 9, was I, I talked about the Euro-US dollar and how the movement higher in yesterday's risk-on environment, that risk appetite, was actually an opportunity to short into the downtrend on the euro. A lot of people are projecting a, a push higher in the euro, and, and that's fine, but rather than projecting a level that might be three or 400 pips from where we are now, I look at it as rungs on a ladder. If one level is able to be taken out, then I'll look to the next level, higher or lower. In this case, if someone was looking bullishly at this pair, the red grab candles, by the way, and here's how grab candles work. They're absolutely keyed off of the wave. And the wave is not proprietary. This is simply the 34-period exponential moving average on the high, the 34-period exponential moving average on the close, and the 34-period exponential moving average on the low. If prices close below the 34-period EMA low, the candles plot red. I differentiate between up and down candles in a more traditional Japanese candlestick, you know, shaded and unshaded, by the lighter or darker shade of red, blue, or green. So I can still keep that analysis. The lighter red is an up candle, darker red is a down candle. If prices close within the confines of the 34 EMA high and the 34 EMA low inside the wave, they paint blue or neutral. If they close above the 34 period EMA on the high, they, they paint green. So I, I gauge sentiment and momentum with the grab candles. I measure the trend with the clock angle of the wave. So not only is the sentiment and momentum still bearish overall, in my opinion, even though we had this up day, the angle of the wave is also moving down at four to six. And because of that, this is actually a selling opportunity into uh, the typical zone that I'll use. And let me just inject the 20-period simple moving average in here. The zone that I like to look at for shorting is the area between the 20-period simple and the 34-period EMA low in this downtrend. So, so there were two wicks here that gave us shorting opportunities into the move higher. And why am I looking for a shorting opportunity? Why am I being bearish? Because the dominant psychology, the directional bias on the Euro US dollar daily is still indicating weakness. Now, will I change my opinion? Of course. I will change my opinion if and when prices are able to do one of two things, actually both maybe. Flatten out the wave, indicating more of a sideways market trend, or pop up through the top line of the wave like the Aussie did, invalidating the downtrend. Then I will change my opinion. But up until then, all my markers are telling me remain a bear on the overall psychology. If I, That doesn't mean I can't get long. But if I'm going to trade counter the directional bias of any market, I must go short term. I don't want to rely on counter trend, counter daily chart, psychologically relevant time frame. I don't want to rely on counter trend movement for a long period of time. 
Therefore, if I do want to look for buying opportunities in the Euro-US dollar, I will do so exclusively on the 5, 15, and 30-minute time frames. If I want to trend follow, I can do so on any time frame because the dominant psychology is still down. So if I'm looking at the Euro-US dollar for opportunities, knowing that I still have a bearish directional bias, not only are these both swing short triggers, if I do want to take advantage of any kind of strength, I'm probably not really going to see a whole lot of opportunities to do so right now in the intraday, on those intraday time frames. So with that being said, this, this time frame probably is my best opportunity to take advantage of what I feel to be the dominant psychology in this market. And again, if we are going to move up higher, that's fine. I either need to see this wave lose that 4 to 6 o'clock angle and or prices pop up through the 34 period EMA high, which is sitting right now at 36.45. Now, that doesn't mean if the market starts to rally from its current levels that I won't do anything before 36.45. It simply means that if I want to get long and take advantage of a move higher, I'll do so on the 5, the 15, or the 30-minute time frame. Notice, by the way, that while the market trend on the daily is down, the market trend on the 15, 30, and 60 is actually up. And this is another, this is another important point, distinction in my trading, which is each time frame reflects a certain slice of psychology short-term, intermediate, or long-term. Now, we use the daily chart as a long-term, psychologically relevant view of that dominant psychology, but I also know that within an up move in an overall down market, there are buying opportunities on the shorter-term time frame. So if and when I do want to take advantage of those, the daily chart and the directional bias that it reflects will help me determine what's counter trend and trend following, and help me determine which time frames I'm going to focus in on depending upon which way I want to take advantage of the market's movement. Very important because it helps you with this, this daily chart will help you with the time frame selection and it will also make sure that you're not fighting an overall trend. In other words, if this trend is down for now, it is, in my opinion, a more prudent entry to be situated as a short position at resistance levels. I think that's the lower risk entry. To be long in this market, I think, is a higher risk entry. Not that you can't, but you don't want to require that the longer term sentiment and momentum continue to go counter trend just so you can get your follow through. Yesterday was a tremendous day in terms of what happened in the psychology of the market. But as I, mentioned, as I mentioned in yesterday morning's chat, I don't want to expect that risk is now back on. I don't believe that to be the case. In fact, by looking at the dollar index, which is still in an uptrend, and looking at the Dow, which is actually in distribution, we are reaching key levels where the dollar is finding support and we're not far from exhaustion and therefore risk aversion in equities. So I'm going to expect weakness. And, and that's what I mentioned yesterday. That yesterday was actually an opportunity to take advantage of entirely way too much, uh, really a, an overreaction to a very significant move, but an overreaction to the longer-term perspective. Near term, it was a tremendous day to take advantage of risk. Fantastic day to take advantage of that, that risk appetite. To do so, well, anything else, short term, would be ridiculous. But longer term, I believe that the exhaustion was really starting to show even before the market closed. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to type in the questions that you might have. I'm going to look over the text here and see if there's any questions that I can address or haven't addressed yet. And... 
we'll take it from there. Okay, so I see a question right off the bat here about limit orders. Okay, so if I'm trend following, and, and this is a good example here of the uh, swing short that I have actually live on the Euro US dollar right now. If I am looking to enter a swing short, What I want to do is look at the value of either the 20 period or the 34 period EMA low. Look at that value, and then I can just simply put a new order in at that and just park my order. I just park it because I know what the value is. I know what price at which I want to engage the market at, so I'll just park that order with a conditional order because I do have a specific level at which there is, uh, that I'm expecting resistance to kick in at. So the market will actually get me in. There's, there's no particular moment at which I feel this is the time I must get in. It's actually not a timing issue. It's a price issue. So I'll look for that opportunity, uh, preferably before London closes. And I don't like my trades triggering during the doldrums of the day, and I did mention power stats. We might have to put that off for another meeting. But in terms of the rhythm of the trading day, once London closes, basically after noon Eastern Standard Time, and before Asia opens, I call that the doldrums. And I'd rather not be in a situation where I'm going to enter a market during that period of time unless I'm willing to just let the market and that position float around for a little while. That will happen from time to time. So the, the price action is what gets me in. Because I have a trend line or some sort of chart pattern or some way to define where there's a breakout or a correction or a fade, um, I just park my order there and wait for it to be met. Make sure that if it's a dynamic level, like a moving average versus a static level, like a psychological level or Fibonacci, that as that value changes, you update your order. You modify that order. Okay. Usually, will only be a handful of pips if that. But make sure you you, dict, you know you do that. And and by the way, I had my limit order waiting, and I would update it each day for about uh, four days before I finally got triggered. As this market was moving lower, I I missed it twice here and here because it didn't get to my 34 EMA low. But what I will show you back over here. is sometimes the 20 period simple will be very helpful because it can be an aggressive level, but it didn't help me here. So I missed my order here, I missed my order there, and then I just kept following the market down, and then I got triggered yesterday and again today. So I'm not at a, at a, at a risk really on my position. I'm not making a lot either. But you'll notice that the value yesterday was 34.98, and the value today at the simple was 34.73, and at the 34 EMA was 34.94. So I'm positioned basically within about a 20 pip range, just below the 3500 level. And what I'm hoping for is just another push lower towards, say, 33.20. We are very close to a recent low, so I'm not going to want to be in a position to expect a lower low. We hit about 33.20 in this area down here. I'll likely just go ahead and get out of this market because right now my preference really is to day trade. Coming into the holiday season, basically after Halloween, I almost exclusively switch over to a five-minute day trading strategy. The validity of this trade in terms of how long I'll hold on to it, based upon the way, would be up here at 36.45. Now, that's only if the risk reward works. You know, I mean, I'm not going to risk more than I could potentially make. So I've already told you where I've gotten in and where I'm going to get out. You see that the risk is a little greater than the reward. So what I'm actually doing right now, and because I just don't trust this market a whole heck of a lot, is my stop loss based upon yesterday's price action? I think that 35.32 high that we put in yesterday 
is going to be a level I'm going to watch, and I wanted to use the major psych level, so I actually put my stop at 35.55. That's where I wanted to keep a very tight stop loss. Okay? All right, so I want to uh, let Val, Val get back here on the line and wrap up our talk. And like I said, I, I present here at FX Street every Monday and Wednesday. Thank you sincerely, everybody, for for coming out today. I apologize for last week. It was Thanksgiving, and I completely overlooked it. But thank you very much for, for making time for, for both Val and I for this presentation. I, and I hope you learned a little something today, okay? Thank you. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate the time. Okay, thanks, Raghi, for everything. I, I find it really interesting. Interesting, sorry. So anyway, we are going to continue talking about this next Monday, and I will be visiting you in your webinar, okay? Thanks all for being here, and bye-bye. Thank you.